Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, companies, and a meeting place of both creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space, offering desk space, uh, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And finally, we're a safe place for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. Uh, this week's talk is by Watershed's very own Zoe Rasbash. She'll be talking about climate justice, the transformation to a green and equal society, and about the role of the arts and culture in achieving those goals. It's going to be a QA and a at the end, with the talk running at around about 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them in the chat window. I'll pick them out to ask Zoe. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. A captioned version of this talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by choreographer Adrienne Hart and roboticist Emma Fillmore. Sorry. Uh, they'll be talking about their new project, Unraveling the Origins of Loneliness and Exploring Social Connectivity and Collaboration Using Bio-Inspired Robotics. Pretty excited about that one. I think it's going to be good. Uh, you can get news on all of our future talks by following us on PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Press the button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. Please feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. For now, though, I'm going to hand over to Zoe. Okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Zoe. I am the Environmental Emergencies Action Researcher at Watershed and Pervasive Media Studios. Um, and that sounds like a really complicated job description, but basically I started in January um, with the task of co-developing a framework for climate action for the creative sector in the Southwest um, to kind of think about how we can create useful resources for businesses to adapt to the emergency. But as part of this, I wanted to think a little bit beyond that just changes that businesses could make to think a little bit more broadly and more deeply about um, the role of art, culture and creativity in what they, they can play in a movement for climate justice to kind of frame my work. So this is kind of an update on my thinking so far and heads up, there's obviously tons you can say on this, uh, this topics, but I'm coming from a specific perspective. So I'll be kind of speaking from that. Um, and that is that my background is from a climate policy um, and activism background. So I was previously working at Amnesty International, um, UK Youth Climate Coalition and climate strategies, um, pushing for kind of more inclusive and ambitious climate policy and action from governments and, and UN bodies. And the term that we use all the time was a just transition. And it's got to that point where, you know, where you're in a bubble and you just assume everyone knows what you're talking about. And so I was like banging on about always about just transition, just transition, just transition. And my housemates were like, so we don't actually <laughs> know what that means. So and for me, like I love this term of just transition. I think it's great and excellent, but it's only useful if everybody knows what you're talking about. So I'm going to start by explaining this term. Many of you may already know what it means, but I'm going to start ex by explaining it and then talk a little bit why, about why I think um, art and culture are an essential part of it and should be more seriously and strategically involved. Um, and what I'll start off by saying is it's a broad term with many interpretations, which is why I like it, but also remember this is my interpretation and there are many others and there's tons of reading you can do on this um, and like amazing grassroots work. So just Google the term and check it out. <laughs> um, and also just wanna say this top uh, presentation is gonna be quite top heavy with climate stuff. Um, and move into the art and culture stuff in the second half. So please stay tuned, even if you think the first bit's a bit boring. Um, okay, so yeah, a just transition. Um, this term comes from discussions between environmental justice activist groups based in um, from civil society groups, uh, uh, civil rights um, activist groups um, in low income black communities um, in, in North America. Um, working with trade unions um, in North America in the 1990s. And they were working together to think about how can we advocate for 
progressive environmental action, which also protects the livelihoods of those low paid workers employed in the fossil fuel industries. Because targeting the fossil fuel industry just meant that the low paid workers employed in them were bearing the brunt of, brunt of climate action. It really wasn't their fault. They need work. They need to pay the bills and look after their family. So the idea was, how can we build solidarity between activists and workers to find a solution that works for everyone? So the idea is that we work to phase out these industries that harm workers, community health and the planet while providing resources and pathways for workers to transition to other jobs before the industry shut down. So that they weren't bearing the brunt of this transition to a green society and get left behind, therefore creating more poverty. So basically, the idea is it's environmental action, but one that also ensures that those who stand to lose the most from the transition to a green economy are the most protective, protected and have a say in planning what it will look like. So building on this history of, of alliance and solidarity, the term has now become a kind of framework for all sectors and all people to move to a green society through a process which prioritizes the inclusion of marginalized groups in decision making. Beyond just those employed in the fossil fuel industry, we can use the term to think about how our transition to a green economy can include, prioritize and benefit those who are currently marginalized or stand to lose um, from the transition. So basically it's to fight climate change, we need to change our society. And a just transition makes sure that while we're doing that, we, we try and end poverty and inequality at the same time. So that was a bit jargony, but I'll try and give an example of what this could look like in practice. So I, an example of what a just transition strategy could look like is potentially using government money <clears throat> to invest in a really high quality, zero carbon and free public transport system in a low income polluted area where citizens and residents are invited to participate in what it would look like on its routes, etc. So it would increase quality of life for low income areas. It democratizes decision making, gets cars off the road, reduces pollution and associated health impacts, reduces emissions and also builds sustainable, accessible public infrastructure that reduces exclusion. An example of what it wouldn't look like is, for instance, a private com company moving into um, uh, a low, building a ton of really expensive carbon neutral homes in a low income neighborhood, which actually ends up just pricing out poorer residents and therefore just displacing the carbon and poverty elsewhere um, and deepening urban inequality lines and exclusion. So that's kind of like you can compare those two and see that the first one. It's all about participation, equality while driving for those um, uh, z that zero carbon um, infrastructure. So a just transition is defined by the Climate Justice Alliance as a vision led unifying place based set of principles, processes and practices. So it's both what we are building towards and how we build it. It's a marriage of social justice and environmental action um, to build um, truly fair, sustainable, sustainable communities and systems. And as a term, I much prefer it to just climate action because Climate action is really vulnerable to being co-opted to just mean individual action. So it would be like me reducing my waste and my individual carbon footprint, which is super important. Um, but this kind of obfuscates the, the fact that the climate crisis is a symptom of systemic issues of our global economic system. The whole notion of like your personal carbon footprint is propaganda from campaigns sponsored by fossil fuel companies such as BP to individualize the problem and distract from their, the fossil fuel industry's culpability. Make us all feel like, oh my God, it's all on us as an individual. So a just transition understands that the scale of the scale of action necessary from the get go, that society needs to entirely transform. And this means fighting for social equality at the same time. It's deeply visionary, participatory and cannot be co-opted to reproduce existing exploitative systems of power because then it will fail in being just. Um, so one thing I'm not going to talk about today is the use of arts and culture to kind of wake people up to the crisis. Everybody knows about the climate crisis, the scale of action and movement building from um, indigenous and frontline communities for like generations, but also like the recent surge of action from youth and scientists. We all know what climate change is. Um, it's not that we need to wake up for what it is. Um, it's that we feel apathetic because the scale of the problem is so huge. Like that's really what leads to an action. So when we talk about the need for transformation, as I'm talking about right now, it seems really big and scary and hard. And unfortunately, it's not like a quick fix, like, oh, let's all just stop using straws, which was also good. But again, the scale of action needs to be much bigger. Societal transformation is a process which happens over a really long period of time, but it's crucial to uh, enact to protect people and the environment. It has to start somewhere. And it, I, or in a way, it's already started the fact that we're having these conversations. Um, and Ale Alexis Fraz, a cultural strategist leading this work, describes this um, anthropological term, the liminal phase. 
And it's a moment in every transformational process where kind of old structures have, have broken down, but new ways of being have not, has not been um, established yet, which is kind of arguably where we find ourselves now. Our current systems don't work for the majority of the global society. Unrest and political divides are high. And this phase is defined by fear, disorientation, um, division and loss of identity, which I think we can kind of see in just UK politics right now. And something to note, in this liminal phase that we sort of find ourselves in, where we're kind of aware that society must change and is in danger, it gives um, rise to really divisional, racist and fascist politics. As the climate crisis worsens and scarcity politics sets in, as in like, we're running out of oil, we're running out of water, everyone like fight each other, it's all, we're all there. Uh, uh, many will turn to anti-immigrant and Islamophobic racism, as we've seen, as a form of rationale and protection. And fighting fascism is, is a part of fighting for a just transition. We must remember this and ensure that climate action we fight for is inclusive and um, doesn't reproduce the exclusive and fascist rhetoric propagated by those who profit from the current system. It's not that we don't have enough resources, it's just they must be better distributed and, man and managed. Which brings us right back around to that just in the just transition. But also I feel like as I've just kind of explained that, the scale of creativity we need to um, to build this society that we're imagining. So in this kind of like crazy, weird, disorienting um, space that we find ourselves in, art and culture can, can really ground us. Um, it's, it offers traditions, uh, practices, myths, and guides to help us navigate uncertainty and be creative within this weird space for change. And supporting transformation is one of culture's most enduring societal roles. So we need to think a little bit more strategically beyond just like awareness raising about how we can use creative processes, creative thinking and creative practice to help us all participate in imagining and building a future that we sort of don't really know what will look like yet. Culture is both a context for and catalyst of social change and community well-being. And a just transition provides space for this, as it doesn't really prescribe answers, but makes a framework of which we can explore different ways to remake society. Um, back to Alexis Fraz, she says, it's truly a creative challenge. And in this sense, in the sense that we are making something and we don't know what it is yet. Um, so just want to say, as I said, repeat again, there's a ton of <laughs> ways you can interpret a just transition. I'm going for a, a, a very broad approach. Um, but yeah, it can be interpreted in many ways. And I'm gonna uh, be relying here on the kind of work of this um, South African scholar called Har Harold Winkler, who kind of suggests the, the breadth of the interpretation is excellent because it creates space for loads of different actors and change makers and stakeholders with a diversity of views to kind of congregate behind it. If we kind of follow Harold and think of just transition as an ideology, and it's this ideology based on principles of moving to a zero carbon, zero inequality and zero poverty society, seen here as, um, on the diagram as ZP, ZC. Um, we, if we all have these principles, it invites participation of um, many different groups who may otherwise disagree with each other on specifics. It can act as like a unifying vision for a broad alliance of change makers. If we can all get behind this idea and have discussions within it, we become actors within a broad ideological project of unified but diversified action. It kind of holds space for everyone from politicians, revolutionaries, reformists, artists, people kind of uh, find themselves all over the political spectrum. And then this kind of slowly shifts the dominant cultural hegemony from elitist, exploitative and extractive to participatory, regenerative and just. And the whole point of a just transition is people getting together, different people, different people within a, a space, a community, to think about what zero carbon and zero inequality looks like for them in their space. It's very place-based, about using the resources they have to invest in what would be best for their community and negotiating negotiating decisions that will work for all and so then in, in, by nature it's going to look very different in different places we don't need to agree um, on specifics at the top level yet which is what's great about it but this paper that i'm kind of pulling from doesn't really go in depth on how each of these little bubbles on this in this diagram on screen um, can contribute and for this i'm going to be zooming on that little artist bubble but i'm going to be going beyond that to think about art creatives creative businesses creative educators and cultural institutions um so building this new society is going to be a long process um, and it has to start somewhere, but it's inherently visionary and creative work. Um, Alexis Fraz, again, outlines three broad ways that arts and culture are essential in the just transition. Um, and these three ways are healing, imagining and creating. And I'm just going to go into a little bit more depth on those. So firstly, healing. So to transition to a more just and sustainable society, we need to heal the harm that our system continues to cause to people living in poverty um, and black, Asian, minority ethnic groups. 
We need to create space for frontline communities to heal as part of a wider society's processes of acknowledgement and reparations so that we don't reproduce the same dysfunctions and inequality in our cli climate solutions. Establishing, this is what I think is really important, establishing a basis of emotion and feeling as a necessary part of climate solutions is so important. And away from this kind of idea that cold, hard, objective science and Western rationality is the only way we can approach climate problems. The climate crisis is a spiritual, political and emotional crisis. And art, creativity and culture are powerful tools for healing and navigating uncertainty and grappling with pain and expressing contradictory things. So I'm going to give an example of where um, uh, art has been used to solve environmental issues, but also heal community divides. So in um, the city of Fargo in North Dakota, uh, they have a red river that runs through, through um, the city and that flooding has been a, an issue for ages and it's got worse and worse because of climate change. And our, over the past few decades, the city has been kind of trying to deal with this. They built this extensive network of stormwater basins um, to protect the community from, from the flooding. But these created like really wide swathes of barren, ugly and unusable land that sit physically separated neighborhoods and kind of marred the city's landscape. So together, residents, including Native Americans, Scandinavian Americans and refugees from Africa and other countries, began to imagine new possibilities for these spaces. And so in partnership with the city planners and engineers, they designed a series of amenities that included um, sculptural features, a natural amphitheater, um, community gardens and festival spaces. And the vision is for these vibrant public spaces to create new opportunities for social interactions, including among groups that have been previously physically and culturally isolated from each other. Um, the process also helped community reconnect to the water as something that is life giving and life enhancing rather than just like a terrifying threat to their way of life from from the flooding. Um, and yeah, this creative approach turned out to have some really amazing environmental and economic benefits. So, for example, the artists convinced the city to experiment with letting um, with not mowing the fields. Um, in order to see what grew there. And then what um, turned out was that these beautiful native grasses that looked aesthetically gorgeous, but also um, were a really efficient way to manage invasive species, which saved the city loads of money and energy. And also the, the project um, built new scientific knowledge on green infrastructure, working with um, city engineers and, and universities. Just like really cool collaborative work that benefited everyone, right? Um, so I'm just going to go on to the next thing that uh, Alexis Fraz says that's um, how art and culture can contribute to the just transition. And that's imagining. So for a just transition, I I've kind of spoken about like the scale of action that's needed. We need a radical imagination beyond the boundaries of our current social reality, because most of the principles of our current society are the root of the problem. So artists are specialists in imagination and have skills in rendering creative ideas in really tangible ways and working in collaboration with um, towards a shared future with engineers, politicians and organizers is essential because together we're working towards building cultural power. And that is our ability to organize and exercise our collective influence to shift society's dominant norms and values. For this, we're working towards long-term systemic change while also enacting short-term change within the current extractive system. So it's kind of weird. It's like we're trying to bring about a green society while we're in one that's really um, exploitative. So there's a lot of that work is kind of riddled with contradictions and art, art and culture can help us navigate co these contradictions in ways that like politics cannot. It's the ability to hold really complex ideas, but also communicate them in ways that can be built upon, which is like a direct antidote to the short termism plagued by governments, um, government led climate solutions. Um, so an example of like really cool imaginative work is um, the Land Art Generator Initiative. Um, it's a project started by two architects um, and they envision a world where the mass proliferation of clean energy systems will also lead to some of the 21st century's greatest works of art and social projects, which is a really cool way to, to start something. So Laggy partners with um, cities around the world to run competitions for local large scale public artworks that also generate renewable energy. The competitions are open to everyone. So they have submissions from like anyone from a school student to like a world-class engineers to a group of artists can enter. And because it's public art, people come up with designs that have benefits beyond um, energy efficiency. And also community members act as the reviewers and judges and the whole process triggers lively public conversations about aesthetics, energy, public space and community identity. Um, and so, yeah, now um, this project, Laggy or LAGI, I don't know, is now experiencing high demand from cities all over the world that are looking for ways to generate public interest and support for clean energy, because it brings that community support along with, along with the de development of the um, en uh, renewable energy. Blah. <laughs> um, and yeah, the last one that Alexis Braz talks about is creating. 
So design and cultural practice have a way of harnessing um, curiosity and exploring alternatives. And the creative process is about confidently walking into the unknown and coming out the other side with new ideas, um, new insights and new pathways to pursue. The creative process involves active experimentation, testing and iteration. And like we need to be uh, creating new systems and seeing how they work locally. And these creative prototypes of new systems and new ways of living are often very small and local, which leads people to criticize them as not um, enough to tackle the scale of the problem of climate change. But we have to start somewhere. And as you can kind of see from these examples that I'm giving, bottom up change can help us realize what we want on a smaller, faster scale and affect our community more immediately. And then we can push change upwards. And a really amazing example of this is the Perry Avenue Commons. And this one I just think is so amazing. So the South side of Chicago, is a predominantly African-American community that has suffered from decades of unemployment, disinvestment, neglect, high levels of poverty, crime, and then associated with that, like a myriad of health and environmental challenges, high energy costs, lack of access to healthy food, high toxins and pollution for, for the community. And the neighborhood is populated by all these abandoned buildings and lots. And in 2014, um, local artist and designer Emmanuel Pratt began working with um, the community, community to build uh, Perry Avenue Commons, a series of aquaponic farms, community gardens and art spaces that utilize vacant lots and buildings and put people to work. The farm helps feed neighborhood residents um, and supplies local Chicago restaurants. Its systems are drought resilient, reducing summer heat effects um, and making sure people can still access food throughout the drought. Um, it prevents flooding, it generates renewable energy, which the community can, the farm can then sell back to the grid and then use that to pay people. So then it has people, employs people to, to work on the farm and also to um, uh, manage its arts and hands on science program for at risk youth who um, uh, have been either excluded from school or can't get employed. And the, also what's amazing is that the project has reinvigorated a, um, a sense of community pride and agency and Pratt himself credits the farm's artistic elements, its murals, its landscape design, its traditional woodworking, its festivals, performances and culinary arts with enabling Perry Avenue Commons to reach its environmental goals. Art creates a welcoming symbol of regeneration and care that draws residents to the sites and changes how they relate to each other and activates a sense of possibility and ownership. And now it's been featured in um, museum and art gallery exhibits um, in Chicago, but also internationally. And through this kind of art uh, 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 validation from the art world, um, city officials have now kind of recognized it as like a, as a real uh, program to support change. And it's led them to change how they um, regulate the, the city so that more people can do this. Um, it's developed a new model for urban agriculture and community energy that can be re uh, replicated elsewhere, which is so cool. And it also is um, working with Harvard and um, MIT to develop new economic models for people, planet and profit that can be put in, into practice. So it's just like really amazing. Started with one guy who wanted to see change in his community and now it's like got this such an amazing effect and it built up to the city and then now working with um, uh, universities throughout the country that can then have um, create models that can be replicated worldwide. So you can see how it starts on this small change and can build outwards. So as, you, as I've just kind of said, like imagining and building these are kind of like utopian dreams, it's really creative work. And we need to start building and imagining outside of our current systems, which is hard, it requires risk and it requires experimentation. And I feel like art, culture and creativity are uniquely placed to support this kind of risky but promising process. And I've got a couple of things I wanted to kind of add on to um, Alexis for us three, three points. And, and one of them is kind of creating um, inclusive conversations. So when broaching the question of inclusive and effective climate action, which is what the just transition is all about, we kind of have to acknowledge how in the UK, the environmental sector and NGOs, so basically those people who are and organizations that are called upon by government to advise on, on environmental policy in the UK are not representative of wider society. Um, and there's a real need to put more effort into centering black, Asian, working class, disabled and transgender people, as these are the groups disproportionately affected by negative environmental effects and climate breakdown. So the just transition aligns the priorities of inclusion with climate action and asks that we don't reproduce spaces and movements which marginalize the needs of these groups. And Perenna Reddy, a New York based activist um, and director of the uh, Queen's Museum, 
describes how people from historically marginalized communities have barriers to participate in civic processes and policy changes. So integrating the arts can make people feel more welcome and create more joy and interest and sustain engagement for longer processes. The arts have a, can challenge what typical climate activism looks like. Climate action when framed as a matter of like individual consumer responsibility, as I was talking about earlier, can alienate many necessary voices from involvement due to the promotion of just like small expensive lifestyle changes. Arts, culture and the creative sector can broaden and deepen and challenge how we think about climate action and invite in new and different forms of practices and knowledges to help us democratize these conversations. Um, and also participation. So this is something that I, I feel really strongly about, which is that I kind of want to revisit this idea of what I was saying earlier of a just transition as a process. So it's something that we all participate in to imagine and build the world we want, right? And how that would look in our local area. But these spaces of making decisions around just transition are already being established. Like it's a very hot term in the climate world. Like um, there's already a just transition, just transition commission in Scotland. Um, there's UN bodies who are kind of working on a just transition, international organizations that already kind of, it's already kind of got momentum. And what I would love to see is more explicit inclusion of artists, creators, cultural practitioners, and educators in these spaces and creative processes in this. And this is the reason why people associate living environmentally conscious lives with giving things up, less meat, less clothes, less travel. But that's because we associate a high quality of life with high amounts of consumption. Building for a just transition is about imagining abundance in new forms. We've got abundance of clean air, of water, of local, fresh, good quality food, but also time. Ending our kind of toxic relationship with capitalist productivity for no reason and working towards like a four day work week or distributed working. So we all have more time and resources to do the things that we love. And a joyful and abundant world is one where we can all participate in arts and culture, where they are an essential part of our school curriculums, where creative education is well funded and accessible to everyone, encouraging like the beautiful and interesting exchange of ideas and participation of low income and marginalized groups and building cities and towns and societies which are healthy, vibrant, beautiful and fun. <laughs> we need artists and creators and creative sectors to help envision and build this because it's not only a central tool to help us grapple with the scale and many facets of this crisis, but it's also something that must be prioritized and protected for the joy that it brings to society. We wanna hold space for our future to be deeply creative. Um, yeah, and so those kind of case studies that I spoke about earlier, which I think are all three of them are really amazing. And um, they come from, from a report that was done by a US-based research group called Helicon Collaborative as part of this like massive 10 year project that's working to kind of reposition arts and culture as a core part of community planning and development to strengthen social, physical, and economic fabrics of communities. And they call this creative placemaking. And what they see as essential is collaboration between environmental sector organizers, um, social movements, creators, um, and decision makers. Um, and as you can see from the previous projects that they, the case studies that they've um, covered, they, they were deeply collaborative, deeply collaborative. So this report kind of aimed to develop a shared language and set of goals for these groups, um, which I are on screen now and I'll, I'll list. So make environmental issues more personal, emotional and salient, addressing the disproportionate harms borne by certain communities and ensure that these communities are beneficiaries and agents of interventions. Build community cohesion, identity, power and leadership. Arts can be a better way to start conversations than workshops. It can help groups understand each other help people see their local experience in a larger context, help people to find common ground across political, geographical and ideological boundaries and create infrastructure that meets people's um, social, aesthetic and spiritual needs, designing physical spaces that cue and reinforce sustainable thinking and behavior and drive sustainable local economies. Um, so I've honestly feel like I've really bombarded everyone with um, information um, and there's so much that you, more you can say on this, um, but I hope this is kind of, laid out both the concrete and intangible contributions contributions that art and culture can play in a just transition and basically collaboration and local action is just really essential and i would really love to this is very the start of a research process for me and i would really love to chat with anyone who's got thoughts on this um even if you completely disagree with everything that i said i would really love to know more <laughs> so please do shoot me an email or DM, dm me on twitter and we can chat um so yeah thanks everyone um, and now we'll open it to questions Thanks, Zoe. That was fantastic. And yeah, um, a lot of stuff there to, 
to dig into. Um, we questions are coming in thick and fast, so we'll start. And you did say that you bombarded us with information, but our first question from George Coombs: uh, What academic sources or areas of research would you recommend to delve into this subject matter in more detail? You know what? It's it, there's so much, and I, because I've been doing this for a few years, I've, I feel like I've read so much, and I can't remember the names of anyone. But I feel like for me, with the just transition, I would say I'm always starting with what communities are putting out and like the kind of lived experience of people working on this so I feel like the Climate Justice Alliance is a really good place to start but I really feel like that paper that I did that I spoke about with the diagram earlier it's it's Harold Winkler and he takes a neo Gramscian approach to the just transition and it really changed my thinking on it because it made me realize like all we have to do is just get people talking about it and that kind of starts the shift um so that was a paper that I really felt that was really helpful um yeah <laughs> Great, thanks. And uh, sort of following on from that, a question from Dr. Watts. Um, as a so scientist and a secondary science teacher, I would be interested to know how you feel art, science, and education can all work together for great change for the future. Gosh, I mean, I'm neither an artist nor a scientist, so I feel like you'd probably be better knowing it than me. But I feel like what I've, when I've been doing some reading on this, it's just kind of this idea of reversing the hierarchy of discipline. So just making sure that we're not Prior, prioritizing science as this kind of like unquestionable rationale that of unflawed logic when actually in reality you know western science is is very flawed if you just look at like coronavirus and like medical racism and stuff and there are many different ways that knowledge is valid indigenous knowledge especially when it comes to to the climate crisis and things like indigenous knowledge kind of span both arts and science so I think I don't know but basically it's just making sure that I think that we have more space to kind of hold both as being true and and equal and working in harmony but yeah I would love to talk to you more about what you how you would approach it <laughs> and do you think there's a particular role for education in that I think was I mean I feel like in all of those case <laughs> studies that we were talking about it was about it, it was about community education and uh, for me, I mean, with our government's stance on state education being unable to criticize capitalism, I feel like there's a real role for community education, especially with how learning it, learning about sustainability in relation to the people that we share our community with and the resources that we share our community with and the landscape that we're based in. So I feel like that's something that's really exciting, which is maybe outside of state education, but community based education. Great, thanks. So I, I wanted to ask actually uh, a word you used a few times and you know, uh, like it's sort of self-explanatory, but uh, I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on what you meant by regenerative and regeneration when you were in this context. Yes. Yeah, so it's like the idea, so we currently live in like an extractive economy, a linear economy where we take stuff and then we use it and we dump it. And it's like, that's why we're also scared about running out of oil, etc. So like as a moving to regenerative society is kind of thinking, you may have heard of the circular economy, which is like where you make sure that the systems you're doing, take, make sure that you can reuse things so that things are coming back into the system and then we're not running out of stuff. But a regenerative system takes that even further. So when we're reusing things, we're healing, we're restoring things, we're restoring um our ecosystems and our landscapes as we kind of do this circular economy. I don't know if that's a very good explanation, but yeah, maybe Google it also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I will. Um, yeah, we've got lot, lots of great comments coming in, but we do have time for more questions. So if you've got questions, folks, please do get them in. I want to ask something though. Um, there's a lot of sort of climate related artworks tends to have sort of a more symbolic than practical value when it comes to um you know you know things like um generating energy or whatever the, the sort of nuts and bolts practical uh stuff so do you think there's a danger there that we we get sucked into these symbolic acts rather than the sort of the difficult unsexy work of actually making change and how do we avoid that danger i uh, yeah i completely agree and like I, I, and it's not to say that there isn't a place for symbolic this symbolic work right because i think a lot of because this process is so long and complex symbolic work that starts conversations is still really important so 
you know, for I'll give an example, which is that um, David Attenborough's like Blue Planet 2, the first ever time he ever did anything about human impact, which is about plastics, um, was like one episode about plastics. And in that following year, the UK saw a 53% drop in plastic, um, single use plastic use. Um, so that was just something that was just like saying something that led to massive action. But then that led to a conversation where uh, youth and frontline climate activists started a campaign where when David Attenborough said he was going to shut down his Instagram account of 6.2 million followers, they were like, don't shut it down. Just pass the mic to people who've got kind of more radical asks just beyond just um, uh, ending single use plastic, something that's more systemic. Um, and so that kind of, I just feel like there's a place what seem, may seem symbolic can actually lead to like a ton of follow on actions that actually lead to like a bigger change. Um, but I also think that just returning to that question, it's, I think it's this in this, this colla the, colla the nature of collaboration. It's like the artists are just one part of this puzzle and you need the engineers and the local politicians and the da 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 to kind of work together to make this happen. And I feel like that in this, all those case studies that really made it clear that it was like the artists had these kind of imagination ideas or like were just part of an urban farm but wasn't just an artwork if you know what I mean it's in that collaboration that I think that you can really get the most of that artistic imagination that, would, that is useful for the just transition. That's great yeah I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've got a question from Aidan Mosby uh, he says that disabled people are disproportionately impacted by climate change and generally experience less justice and are largely invisible in a lot of community initiatives uh, how do we address this as part of a just transition? This is such this is such a massive problem, and I feel like this is one of the main things that we we need to get better at in a just transition. Because I mean, again, let's talk about the the plastics debate, right? Oh, let's all stop using straws. But there was no um, prominent disabled voices in the UK mainstream environmental movement to say, "Hey, that's actually we need to have straws available for people with disabilities." It's the same when you kind of have these initiatives, oh, we're going to, um, someone's like, oh, we're going to try and encourage all of our customers to, um, to cycle rather than drive or get public transport to our venue and then get rid of a car park. But what about the disabled people who still need access? It's again, coming back to representative decision-making of the community. So it's bringing these people together and making sure that those decision-making bodies are representative of everyone and prioritizing people who have been most marginalized. So that being a massive one being being disabled people within our communities, but then again, you know, working class people and um, people of color. Great. And I, do you think there are sort of particular areas where the sort of areas of social justice where the climate movement is really failing? Um, you know, obviously we've mentioned disability, but are there any others where you think there's particular work to be done? Well, I think the thing is, is that there's like with the climate movement, it's a very complex space because you've got like it started and like it's heart beating heart is indigenous and frontline activists, um, people of color in the global south, like these frontline communities who are the most affected, disabled people, LGBTQ plus people in the global south. Um, but their voices aren't being heard by the, the, the mainstream climate movement in, in the UK and, and the West in general, Northern Europe. So it's not that the climate movement is failing, it's that like European and like American climate movement is failing to listen and be led by those on the ground. Um, and this is like, like, this is terrible. It's in a ton of things that are propagated as climate solutions are just a new ways to kind of marginalize existing, um, existing groups or make things worse for, for people in the global South. I'll give an example, which is, um, electric cars for their batteries you've got to get that specific type i can't remember the, the thingy i can't remember what it's called lithium. now lithium which has to be you know mined in these mines which is like exploiting children and so it's like oh yeah we're all using electric cars but like these systems that you're setting up are still equally as exploitative to those in the global south so that's it's not a failing of the climate movements a failing of like yeah europeans and americans basically <laughs> yeah as with so many things uh... <laughs> Yeah, a question from Joe Lansdowne. Uh, I'm interested in what it is that made you, Zoe, so committed to this work and what from your activism methods you, you're you bringing into your research process. I guess that's kind of two questions, but we'll, we'll let I, Joe away with that. 
<laughs> for the first one I almost put this in but I was like I've got too much to say so I won't but like I can I've been asked before like what got you really like into this like climate and environment stuff and it, I can really I followed it back in my memory to a tape that like an audiobook that I listened to as a kid that was like about a princess who saved the rainforest and it was like she like there was an evil king and queen who wanted to like chop down the rainforest and she was like no biodiversity is cool and I must have been like three or four or something but I remember being like whoa the rainforest so cool and like since then it's kind of snowballed and become like my entire personality and career um but it, that again is uh, a prop to the power of kind of art and culture in kind of inspiring people to action um and what was the second question sorry um <laughs> uh, what from your activism methods do you bring into your research process I feel like um I have more activism experience than research experience so I feel like pretty much all of it it's all about kind of bringing people together to discuss how everyone's affected and then kind of try and come up with solutions to problems which is the things that I learned from the youth movement and like there are loads of things like just like little techniques like I don't know if you guys have done um like call cool symbols like like agree disagree it's like ways that you can communicate with groups virtually and in person that are like really inclusive and to people who have like hearing problems or a neurodivergence so there are all these like little things that I learned from the youth climate movement that I will use all the time now it's just part of um whatever work I'm doing great great and, and where do you see this work going for you in the future I mean I know you're you're with us at Watershed for for a little while where, where do you where are you planning to take this I don't know. I would really love to see things, something in Bristol, like like one of those projects that we we would that, those case studies. I think it'd be really cool. And I know St. Werberg City Farm is starting to like think about these kind of things, these interlocking issues and in like land justice and climate justice and like um, being a, a citizen of Bristol. So I feel like there's loads of like places in my local area where these conversations could start and we could bring about something really cool. I would love to be a be a part of that, like as like a volunteer or whatever. I think that'd be really amazing that's what i would like to do after right. reading that report great well i think unless anyone wants to get in a question in the next five or ten seconds i think we can probably wrap it up there thank you so much zoe uh this has been phenomenal and yeah I've, the the enthusiasm is is just the greatest thing on a, on a friday afternoon so thank you so much great uh so um Thank you very much. And before you all go, next week's talk is by choreographer Adrienne Hart and roboticist Hema Fillmore. They'll be talking about their new project, Unraveling the Origins of Loneliness and Exploring Social Connectivity and Collaboration Using Bio-Inspired Robotics. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PN Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or subscribe to the newsletter on the website. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, give the video a thumbs up, the more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please feel free to share this link now. A captioned version of the video will be available shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week.